Okay, thank you very much. I have particular pleasure in uh, introducing Justin Chadwick, our next speaker, and I take that pleasure because I'd also like to ask you to thank Justin. He has been helping us with the organisation of the conference and has been, let me say as politely as I possibly can, our most favourite dog's body, <laughs> doing all kinds of jobs that needed to be done. So I want to thank you particularly for the help you've given us in the uh, organisation and I would like you to do so too. <laughs> but that's not why Justin's here this afternoon. He's here to talk about a very interesting topic and it is sorry but we cannot supply Empire Trade Preference and its impact on Australian motor bodybuilders. Justin is currently a PhD candidate in the Department of History within the School of Humanities, so we are very pleased to welcome one of our own this afternoon. Thanks, Justin. Thank you very much, Jennifer. I now will have to live up to this sort of uh, build up, and I feel very humble being in front of. Don and Norm because they know so much more than I do because the area of my, my research is, is quite narrow um, in trade unions and GMH in South Australia for a 50 year period from 1931. So uh, the reason why I've got this today is because while I was delving through the wonderful archive of uh, Holden's at the State Library here just down the road, is I came across some correspondence between uh, Holden's and government officials and also Holden's and some of their suppliers of, of steel product. And it was all to do with the introduction of the Fisher body. Now, we've already touched on that today, which has been quite good, but I'll quickly run over it again because the importance of the introduction of the new Fisher uni steel design or the, 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 the one turret top design for the covers was absolutely revolutionary. This was a massive move away from the old style carriage building. We'd gone from building buggies, which were drawn by horses, and basically transfer the technology of that onto the power plant being instead of something which does big poos in the roadways to, to, to make some big, big amount of noise and pollution from an engine. Now, the body itself is still the same. It still remained to have things like timber, predominantly timber. It had leather, it had everything which a carriage had beforehand. And now we've got a car which from 1935 when GM introduced it was all steel. Still of course the inside were the inside bits, but outside it's all steel. And here we've got a promotional photograph from, from General Motors showing some baseball stars, don't ask me who they are, sporting is not, not a big thing. But obviously these are some pretty popular baseball people from 1935 standing on the top of a turret top car. One thing you could not really do in cars before that was stand on the roofs of them. Because if you did, you'd be falling through the roof because of the canvas top. Now, the canvas top cars were great if it was a tourer, you take the top, top off, drive down the road, wind through your hair, looking like Audrey Hepburn, wonderful. The reality is that when it rains, this stuff is not that great. The materials corrode. They have to be replaced, they have to be maintained. A steel top, that all goes. Suddenly you've got a car which you can drive all year round, be weatherproof, be safe as well, much safer, than, especially if the car rolls over, and most importantly, a lot quieter. And this is a reduction of mainly wind noise. When it came to actually making the, the, the turret top, the process had to change as well. Suddenly what you've got is the top of the car being made from one sheet of steel. Now that sheet of steel is longer than this bench here and much, much wider. Now this changed the way that the engineers had to make their dies, obviously. So the major manufacturing process was altered in, in a very, very big way. So dies suddenly went from the sort of size of being, say, an average bonnet or hood size, whatever you want to call it, or, or a boot leg, which were the largest panels generally, to be this really big roof being squished in one big press at a time. So these press sizes suddenly went up in, in scale, much, much larger. As we can see from this ad, you probably can read some of the text in there, though it's extremely
extreme misogynistic this ad. It's amazingly like, you know, this woman, this cheap and driver car, be safe, just like the night in, in shining armor above. I don't know what the advertising part was thinking at the time, but it's, you know, it's a thing. So what we have is a car which is much, much stronger. Now, of course, Holden's uh, was Australia's biggest motor body builder at the time. And they were building, as most people know here, obviously, is they were building the majority of, of the bodies for General Motors and their subsidiary uh, entities for the Australian market, here in, primarily here in South Australia. This example here is round about the time of the changeover. We can see in the foreground the old style car still, which had the non-steel roof. And just in the background, we have a full bodied roof. So we've got the old and we've got the new coming through. Now, Holden, like most companies, are really good at publicity. And this is by far probably the best publicity shot, much, much better than a couple of guys holding baseball bats standing on top of a roof of a car. Because here we have an indication of the strength in, which is in this single steel roof or this all steel car. So even if we look at these timbers and they are something like a lighter timber, like pine for instance, that's still a lot of weight on there. And to reinforce this strength, what have they done? Well, they've opened up the doors. The doors are integral strength in cars. So you take the door out, these are suicide doors as well, so we've only got this little slim pillar here, and you open up the boot, another point of strength. So what we got is an indicator, this car, this new design, is strong. So I think that's a great ad. I like it. For Australia, the introduction came in around 1937. This uh, is a newspaper story, the amazingly beautiful and comfortable, powerful, all wonderful unisteel introduction of the new Chevrolet. It's going to happen in 1937. Now, these are going to be across the board. Holden's and TJ Richards, another manufacturer here in Adelaide, are going to be doing pretty much at the same time. Now, when it comes to the supply of material, they went to their local suppliers. And the local suppliers in Australia were Lysett and Baldwin's, they're both British companies, and the other one was Armco, which is an American firm, which also had, had some interests with, in Britain as well. So they were producing in America and Britain. All well and good. The only problem is, though, is that the steel requirements, as I've said before, were very different. Suddenly they got a lot bigger. That's not the real nub of the issue. Because in 1936, the Australian government, after a number of years, which I'll quickly <coughs> explain in a second, a number of years of negotiation with Britain, brought in very restrictive trade practices. Which is, if you are a motor body builder in 1936, enough uh, concern to have many sleepless nights. And it goes back to around 1902, during the period of, well, sorry, Colonial Conference. And, and one of the resolutions of that conference was that the dominions of the empire will have a preferential trade deal between themselves. This means that inside the empire, we'll trade between ourselves, exclusionary to everyone else, if you can do it. So if we can buy something which is made in Canada, we will do so. Now, for the British, which traditionally brought in raw materials, sent them up to the mill, and they made something, and they sent it out back to the colonies, that was great. Now, for a nascent country such as Australia, where secondary industry was only just growing, this is probably not really the best thing for our development. But as far as home was concerned in, in Whitehall and London, eh, they don't worry about that. So this is actually the start of a trading block. It was reinforced in the 1917 Imperial War Conference. Same thing, they said, okay, this instance, uh, it's a great example, is the wars going on, we can't trade with European parts of Europe because, you know, they kill, they kill us. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll continue by focusing on the, the empire itself. Following the war, uh, everything seemed ticking boo for a while, and then the Great Depression struck. And of course that, with its uh, incumbent mass unemployment, made both the empire and its the dominions rethink again how they're going to 
try to improve the economic situation. And by improving the economic situation, it improves um, or lessens unemployment. And here we've got a little quote from the Senate saying how wonderful this whole intra-empire trade will be. This is fantastic. This will save us. The result of this was the same whether it be in England. Here we've got John Reed saying the empire be developed as a single economic unit with internal free trade as the ideal. So this is trade liberalism within the trading bloc of the empire. Now, for Sir Robert Horn, he actually said, well, they haven't done much. We've got lots to sell them, and they want our stuff. So it's going to be great for Britain. In Australia, following the 1932 Imperial Economic Conference, again, they're still trying to resolve the issues of the Depression, because things hadn't moved out yet at that stage, is that we came up with this concept of the United Kingdom and Australia Trade Agreement. This agreement was meant to make sure that we had two-way bilateral agreement which would ensure that Britain would buy our stuff and we'd buy their stuff. Now, things haven't changed much. People still buy our raw materials and we buy their finished goods. So this was pretty much the same as... It's just another brand of colonialism, really. So it hadn't changed from 1902 to 1932. And then in 1936, after, under the aegis of... Joe Lyons, as Prime Minister, he said, we want to have this and we're going to implement the trade diversion policy. The trade diversion policy was a stronger version of all the other ideas of the economic policies beforehand, in that we will buy British or Empire goods. The trade diversion policy was that we will actively not buy anything from America or Europe if we can buy it from Britain. This policy was so stringent, and this is where it comes for us as our motor body bill, bills example, became so stringent that the only way you could get something which was not being made by Britain or within the British Empire is you had to have a licence. And that licence was only issued at the discretion of the Minister for Customs and Tariffs, or Customs and Trade, or the Minister for Trade Treaties. Here we have two men who caused living heck for the motor bodybuilders in Australia in the mid-1930s. Henry Gullett, who was the Minister for Trade and Customs until he got sick and quit, and then he became the following year Minister for Trade Treaties after a period of time in the wilderness of not having a portfolio. Very instrumental, very pro-empire. His replacement was Thomas White. Now, if you thought Gullet was pro-empire, White might have just as well been English because he did not care for what was going on basically in this country. And we had the dis discussion previously today about Bruce, uh, about the period of the um, construction of the Wirralay, for instance. Sam Bruce and his Prime Minister said, we, no, don't build planes here. We should build planes in Australia. The English can do it for us. So he was actively against the construction of aircraft in Australia in that pre-war period. <coughs> so, in around about June or mid-year mid 1936, we have this kind of letter from, yes, John Story, he gets a mention. Here he is. <coughs> to Tom White. And he's basically saying, look, the British manufacturers have promised us goods under the agreement, we will abide by the agreement. There's no one here at this stage we're not trying to, to go outside of the whole concept of the, of the <coughs> trade agreement. They certainly believed in it and they were trying to adhere to it. However, the problem is, is that when they approached companies like Lycett and Baldwin's Armco and the <coughs> National Archives uh, archive is, is thick, the correspondence is just phenomenal. It goes on for reams and reams of, of pages because what we have is the motor bodybuilders like Holden's and, and Richards and Ruskins are asking their suppliers in Australia, can you please supply this size material? And they're saying, yeah, sure, not a problem. We can do that, yep. And they're not actually going to their parent mills in the UK and asking, can we make this size? 
They're just making the assumption, oh, this is the same as before. They want to have this X amount of tonnes. We'll, we'll do that. And so they, they <coughs> got the order book out, signed off on it, you sign here, all sorted. Excellent. However, when it comes to the, the actual crunch, is that Holden's could not use, nor could anyone else use these, to make the new turret tops. The correspondence gets more and more um, vivid, we can say. And to the point where Holden's are quite forceful. Claude Richards, he's just outright nasty. And if that, him and White, I'm surprised, if they were in different states, they probably would have it all in brawl because they were really, really antagonistic. White said, no, you can't have it. And Richard was saying, we don't get this material. I'm closing the shop. I've got nothing to do. Finally, what happened is that a license was allowed for the motor body builders through Armco. Now, Armco said, look, we've got producers in America, we've got producers in Britain. We know we can't make it in Britain. So we'll have to get an American product. White says, OK, we'll, be, we'll give you this license temporarily, but it's only under the proviso that we have a full investigation into using British materials. Now, this is... He just, he's just blinded by this ideology. He's got this correspondence saying to him, we can't get the material required for what we need to build. He ignores it. He said, sorry, we can only try it. We'll try the English mills. No, no, try the English mills. This goes on and on and on. <laughs> and so at such a stage, he goes, right, that's it. I want to have a report to show that you tried this. And these guys, they're just pulling their hair out because they, of course, you know how long. You can't just go out there and chisel a car out of nothing. It doesn't take five seconds to make a car. You've got dice made, you've got this way. It goes on and on. Say, fine, we'll do this. Holden says, right, you send your representative from customs from Port Adelaide to, to our plant and we'll show you how it's done. They get the press out, they squish it. And they say, look, it does it, it fits, but this stuff is rubbish. The material's not good enough. Then, lo and behold, Lyset get a letter from Lyset in the UK, Lyset Australia is. Saying, oh, yeah, by the way, we actually really can't do this size because our mills aren't big enough. We just can't do it. Finally, finally, and this is where, where uh, we have this issue from Arco saying, look, well, you know, if we'd like, we'd like to be able to do it, we can't. He, so he actually writes to, to, to White, this guy, Cobro, who's the MD of Arco, saying, look, we just can't do it. We can get it from our American plants because they're tooled up for the American design cars. They've been doing it for two years, thereabouts. They'll be all fine, uh, but we just can't get it from the UK. Why? He goes, I don't care. Try again. I will try it. So even though he's got all this evidence in front of him, he re absolutely refuses. Now, Holden's say, we won't make a big issue out of this. We'll just carry on. Uh, we don't want to have press. But Richard's go, he basically says, bug you. I will go, and he had a stoush in the mail, in the press, with White over this. He called him Bunkum, he called him things. He ended up writing a letter to the Prime Minister saying that he will sue for libel against White. Finally, after all this, after we've had over a thousand workers stood down in South Australian plants alone because they can't get material to start building. Suddenly, the impact here is here. Now, remember, this is 1936. We've just rolled off the end of the, of the Depression. Unemployment is still a really hot issue. Unemployed people, or laying stuff off, is a big no-no. So this kind of stuff in newspapers, which goes national, is the last thing the government wants to see. So White is told, back off. And Holden, Laurie Hartman writes this letter, which I love this. We hesitate to say, we told you so. <laughs> but eventually what happened is they get the materials, they build the new car, and everything's fine. But for that 12-month period, there was serious concern about how these Australian manufacturers were going to get their materials in to build for the orders they had. As a postscript, 
during this period, 1936, Lysett actually said to the government, we will build a plant to make this particular steel, but it won't be this year. It takes a while to build steel plants. And because also the steel, all the steel plants pretty in this country were making gal iron for construction. So the priority was making soft, pliable material for car bodies. <coughs> that plant was eventually built in Port Kembla and opened in January 1939. And that's when Australia started to make their own sheet steel for automotive bodies. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Please be gentle. <laughs> I'm a little rusty on this, but one of the things that Hotnet mentions in his book is that GM, when the curb top came out, basically said, you no longer need to make your holding bodies. We can supply press steels. And Hotnet supposedly communicated back to them and said, we're already doing steel bodies for Chrysler. I'm a little confused because, as I understand it, Richards was looking after Chrysler. And, and this is where I'm a little out of my loop, so, you know, can you fill me in as to how to do that? A, that's a great question. I think what happened is that he was using that, uh, that custom-made study slash drinks cabinet a little bit too much when he's writing his book. <laughs> because I think that the, uh, the issue is that uh, he's very, let me just put it this way with memoirs, it's, it's a puff piece for himself. How he could have been building Chrysler bodies. Now that, that image I showed before, which had the um, the, the tourer and the, the full hard tops in the background, supposedly that's from the State Library of South Australia. They're saying that's Chrysler and Plymouth bodies in 1935. But they're saying 33 to 35. And I don't necessarily believe that's the truth of the matter. Norm's got his finger up. Yeah, no, um, Richard didn't have the capacity to build to Chrysler's totally. Body production, so most Plymouth bodies were built at home. Okay, okay. okay. The other thing too is that um, Hartnett does mention his, his uh, memoir about how they were building bodies <coughs> for everyone, and they had all their all their plans. So they, even though they were building competitors' vehicles like what, bodies, so they might be building for Chrysler and GM and all of GM's range. So they could actually they had this sensitive competitive competitors' in, um, information. And they yes, said, he yeah. said, oh, well, we can always sell that. Yeah, but you see, Jim, when it brought out its curve top, it was still using wood in the, down, in the lower portions of the body and, mm -hmm. and around, the, uh, uh, around the doors. You know, that carried on uh, past the, the introduction of the curve top. That's because it's cheap. Mm -hmm. Well, but that was just the way Fisher did things. And Fisher was a law unto itself within GM. But how, how can Hartnett claim that he's doing this in 1937 when we've seen pictures of 1935 turret tops in, in the United States? So it's an art to hearts. But they weren't full steel bodies. So the issue is how much wood is in the vehicle. Yeah. And Ford was still putting wood in their vehicles up to well up in the 30s. So the issue is when did the full steel body get built? Holden's built a full steel body in 1937, but they built it earlier, a full steel body for Chrysler earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they did beat here. Oh, the yeah. issue is it being full steel or some steel and some wood. Okay. The turret top's so got nothing to do with it. Yeah, but, well, the turret top was just all that steel top. Mm -hmm. And really, that was, it was a marketing employee for GM as much as anything else. And that's why you get celebrities like baseball players on the top of the roof. Oh, I've got a feeling that the photo that you showed of the Holden plant with open bodies and steel top cars, I think those cars weren't filled full no, top no, no, bodies. No, no, that was from the, that was 90, well, yeah. the, the, yeah. the, the State Library has 33 to 35, is it? No, circa 33 to yeah. 35. Yeah. So I, I would say it's probably that. My, my point more is it's illustrative in that we've gone from this, this topless 
topless, as in non steel top doing car to what is an enclosed body. And which is one thing which uh, uh, Ted Holman said to his dad, said, we're going we're gonna to have these cars like this. And, he, and his dad said, no, it's going to drop in. Uh, my understanding is also that um, one of the reasons the motor industry became centralised in Australia was that, in fact, Australia did such a good job of parts commonisation, steel parts, timber parts, other, that the sharing between different models across corporations was such that um, eventually the corporations who were trying to compete against each other um, in Australia, to a certain extent, they lost an advantage because there was so much commonisation of parts, and therefore they and and when steel bodies became the norm, and as you alluded to earlier, the complexity of creating steel tools and the t lead times necessary, Australia was getting confidential drawings out of the states up to two two and a half years before production. Yet the Australian engineers were building Chryslers and the GM products next to each other in the same drawing office. At, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, it was it was the beginning. In fact, the, the steel body process was really the beginning of the corporations realising that they had to have individual companies handling their products, as opposed to one company covering a whole range of products, both English, uh, European, and, and American. Yeah, especially because like the from the nineteen well, from the nineteen twenties, GM had plants in every in every major area, like Opel, obviously, Britain, Sweden, we had the one in Sweden. The issue for them is that they, they were being driven by, by GM Detroit to say, we've got this annual thing. And this was always this argument with Hartnett and GM overseas operations in New York saying, we can't do these, these changes every year. Because we, we, the number one, population isn't big enough to buy them. Number two, the cost of tooling up is so high because you, you only get it after the economy is a state. You've got to break even point. After that, you're making lots of money. But up to that point, you are losing money until you get to break even. So you've got to sell so many vehicles to get to that break even. The problem with this country is we, we never did until after the war, and then we made lots of it. But the thing about too is that styling, the annual change, the styling change, of course, as the this, this, this steel body came in, suddenly you really could start mucking around with design. And you could start getting a streamlined, you start seeing the streamlined designs. Uh, headlights into bonnet, like into into the fairing system. Everything changed, and suddenly that became a lot more. Uh, the competitive edge in the design area became very, very uh, touchy, I suspect, and time-consuming. And time-consuming. So the cost of that, compared to the cost of putting together a body for uh, an earlier model vehicle, would be very, very different. And so therefore, it becomes much more sensible. Great, thanks very much, Justin. Oh, oh one last question. I, I, I just, um, I'm not sure how it relates exactly, but um, Luskins uh, in Melbourne showed, I think, I have to check the date, but I think 1936 displayed uh, an all steel body, which they claim is the first all steel body in Australia. Have you come across any correspondence from Luskins regarding this whole issue of? Supply. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the only reason why uh, I concentrate more on Holden is because my thesis is on Holden, so I just look at that. And also because I'm South Australian and we are bitterly parochial. <laughs> <laughs> and Ruskins were involved with it. There's a few other firms in, um, in Sydney as well who were looking at these wider sheds to make turret tops. So it wasn't just Holden's and Richard's, but they had the most to lose because they were the biggest firms. But, uh, third, third in a row was Ruskin, so the correspondence is there. Uh, if you want, have a look at it. I, I pay for the digitisation of it. Uh, it's all on the National Archive website, so you can download it for free now. So thanks. And, uh, <laughs> but it makes it some really fascinating reading. Really fascinating reading. Once you through it, hold, you know, go through it. But this, this argument between White and, and Claude Richards is just great. I hate each other. Thanks very much, Justin. Great.